Hello there, welcome to a Year 13 video on economic development. In class this week we've been focusing on some of the key barriers to development, factors that hold countries back from achieving sustained, sustainable and inclusive growth and development. And in this video I want to focus on two key specific barriers to development, namely inadequate property rights and also the impact of corruption. So property rights, not something that every student studies, but I think increasingly important in the in the development debate. What are property rights? Well, essentially, uh, property right confers a legal control or ownership of something. So it's an ownership of resources and also how they can be used. Now, resources can be tangible, for example, land rights, or intangible, uh, such as intellectual property. And for markets to operate efficiently, most economists would argue that property rights must be clearly defined and protected, perhaps through government legislation and regulation. Now, these property rights can be owned by individuals, uh, businesses and governments. And there's clearly a major issue with property rights as a development barrier. For example, more than a billion people in the world lack formal identification. Uh, and that is a major factor holding back uh, many countries. So why might the absence of property rights hinder act as a barrier to development. Well, um, the World Bank is, is extremely interested in this kind of stuff. I've just uh, highlighted a couple of uh, their recent posts on social media. Uh, for most of the world's poor and vulnerable people, secure property rights, including land tenure, really key, are a luxury. And unless this changes, it will be challenging to achieving many of the sustainable development goals. The World Bank clearly thinks that's the secure property rights are vital to help eradicate poverty and, and in particular women's land rights reduce gender inequality. Here's a second social media post just recently. Without secure land and property rights, it's simply not possible to end poverty and achieve the SDGs. And I'll post a link to that World Bank uh, report, Seven Reasons Why Land Matters for Sustainable Development. So property rights are hugely important. We're going to look at some key factors for your notes in a second. Um, be it, for example, uh, property rights being used to, to control poaching of, of um, endangered species, the rights to own and run a business, to have a digital identity, for example. And something we'll touch upon in a second, uh, preventing the tragedy of the commons. But for the notes, if you're looking to make great notes, here are seven key uh, points you can note for explaining why property rights are important. The first one is that if you have protected, legally enshrined protected rights, that can actually act as a catalyst to stimulate investment. Investment in capital, in irrigation, in farm machinery and things, in farmland. And that is crucial to lifting the yield, the, uh, the output per hectare, or the productivity of the farm sector, which in turn, of course, can drive high, higher per capita income. So protected rights in property are really, really important. We often see that, by the way, when uh, if we think about the example of Zimbabwe, 20 years ago, land was seized by Mugabe's regime from predominantly white farmers, not exclusively. Zimbabwe, 30, 40 years ago, when I was studying economics as a student, um, was one of the well, one of the richest countries in sub-Saharan Africa and indeed had one of the most productive, uh, viable uh, farm sectors. Fertile soil and of course now they've really struggled um, and farm productivity in Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe has collapsed in part because of arbitrary land seizures. Um, if you have property rights, governments can generate land-based taxes and then invest in social infrastructure. So proper titling of land uh, helps you to be able to identify who owns the land um, and then you can tax it. And many low and middle income countries have fairly low per capita incomes, clearly, but also low tax yields as a share of GDP. So taxing land is a, a critical a critical way of increasing the tax revenues for things like education, health and housing. Secure rights protect the environment, particularly to help fight deforestation. I think this is a, an incredibly important point. Those of you who are really interested, of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the climate change debate and the significant threats uh, on, on in Indonesia, for example, and in, and in the Brazilian Amazon. Here's an article. Uh, returning the Amazon to the tribes helps save the rainforest. One way 
to cut back on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest could well be to grant more of Brazil's indigenous population full legally protected property rights to, to tribal lands. And many, many countries around the world are now thinking about how they can formalise what used to be customary land rights, uh, land populated by indigenous communities. And the aim, of course, is to protect the environment, improve productivity and improve uh, forest management to make growth more sustainable. Land rights are also important for urban development. Uh, those of you who've played SimCity will know that if you can assign parcels of land, that can often act as a, a catalyst to stimulate the growth of cities. And no country in the world has grown rich without urbanising first. People with land ownership can borrow money secured against their property. We call that collateral and create capital. And crucially, again, again, I'm emphasising certain points, I guess, uh, land right protection is essential. It is tremendously important uh, to uh, to improve, drive forward gender empowerment. Many women across the world continue to be denied land rights. Around, around the world, the rights to land are not equitably distributed at all, and particularly for women. In fact, uh, you know, high percentage of women still encounter in, in low-income countries huge barriers in their land rights, including well, you know, legal barriers simply to own land. Um, the World Bank in 2019 launched the Stand for Her Land campaign. And do, do check out the website. Uh, just type in Stand for Her Land in Google. It was launched in 2019 in a, in a bid to promote women's land rights. And also, uh, critically, those of you who've done a lot of microeconomics, the protection of intellectual property also promotes uh, the rewards from research and development and innovation. If you have a, a, a trademarked, copy, copyrighted, patented idea, uh, that increases the potential supernormal profits, driving innovation. And of course, that can be a catalyst for dynamic efficiency going forward. So for this slide, if you want to take a screenshot, if you've got great notes already, these are key reasons why property rights can drive development, whereas the absence of property rights can be a significant barrier to development. Now, this is a terrific six minute video from Marginal Revolution University. I'm not going to play it now, but I'm going to link to it in the comments section of my own video on the work of Hernando de Soto, who is perhaps one of the most prominent economists developing the idea that improving property rights and critically improving the ease of doing business is critical for countries to lift their per capita incomes and reduce poverty. Time for a quick multiple choice question. Which country came highest in the 2020 World Bank Ease of Doing Business report? Press the pause button. Which do you think, which country was the, the best ranked, highest ranked country in the annual report on the ease of doing business? Was it Sweden, New Zealand, Singapore or Nigeria? Have a go. Well, the answer is... New Zealand. New Zealand came top. The World Bank every year, by the way, they publish a report on the ease of doing business. From how many days it takes to start a business, how efficiently the labour market works, how quickly can you get connected to the grid and register property and can you access finance and how easy is it to pay taxes and trade. The ease of doing businesses, how easy is it to enforce contracts and debt, for example. And uh, many developing countries now are trying to improve their ranking on ease of doing business, because if they can, they can improve their um, their attractiveness to inward investment. Another really oh sorry here we go here's the here's the, here's the data from 2020 New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Denmark, all in there. Georgia actually doing pretty well in terms of uh, that performance. Uh, interestingly, according to this report, it took almost six times longer to start a business in the places ranked in the bottom 50 than those ranked in the top 20, including the countries shown in, in this chart. Uh, countries like Togo, Jordan, Bahrain, Pakistan, China, India, Nigeria, all making notable improvements. Um, in, in the top 50 countries in the world, for the ease of doing business, there are only two African countries and no Latin American countries. Now, a video on property rights would not be a proper video for you if you're preparing for your A-levels and IB, if we didn't mention the tragedy of the commons. I think this is absolutely crucial. The tragedy of the commons is a metaphor used to illustrate a potential 
often many conflicts, between the individual self-interest of people, of producers and consumers, and the common and public good. In the original version of the term, the tragedy of the commons, uh, the example was used of a stock of grazing land open to all and used by livestock farmers in a village. And of course, every time a farmer adds more livestock to graze on the commons, because it's pretty easy to do so, uh, the common can become overused, overexploited, and the result is that soil quality falls and, and that the resource for all users uh, goes down. Uh, the value of the resource de depreciates. And in fact, you may get long-term irretrievable, irretrievable permanent damage. So this is when the, uh, we have a common pool resource, essentially a public good. A common pool resource is, is a rival in consumption, uh, but non-excludable. Grazing land, forestry, fish stocks, etc. really good examples. Uh, aquifers. And common pool resources are easily over-exploited without protection of property rights and also strong, resilient social norms. So the lack of well-defined and protected property rights can lead to many examples of the tragedy of the commons. Please do have a read of that in, in, uh, on Google. It's a really important concept. Again, I'll link to this video in, uh, in the comments section of my YouTube video here. But I do think every economist who studies A-level and IB economics must know about the work of the great and the late, sadly, Eleanor or Lynn Ostrom, uh, who got the Nobel Prize for economics. Um, and uh, Ostrom made a huge contribution, an enormous contribution to our understanding of how to overcome the tragedy of the commons, including things like how small communities and groups can use social norms of conduct and voluntary voluntary rules and penalties to manage things like grazing land and alpine commons and, and lobster fisheries and things in, in different parts of the world. So we've looked at property rights. In the second part of this video, I want to look at corruption. So in, in our lesson, uh, our development economics lesson, we were thinking about barriers to development and the absence of property rights uh, is crucial. And so too, of course, is, is corruption. Indeed, Professor Paul Collier from Oxford University um, who has talked about barriers to development and ident identified what he calls four development traps, a sort of media-friendly phrase that countries can fall into, one of which is poor standards of governance and failing institutions. And indeed, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16, peace and justice and strong institutions, uh, is crucial uh, to, uh, to extreme, uh, reducing extreme poverty. So corruption, of course, is... One of those topics that you can easily bring into any discussion. Here's another quiz question for you. Which country came lowest, aka worst, in the 2020 Transparency International Rankings for Corruption? Was it Somalia? Was it South Sudan? Was it Sweden? Or was it Scotland? I'll give you a clue here. The answer starts with an S. What do you think? Well, in 2020, uh, it was Somalia who came worst for corruption. These, this is a list of the most corrupt countries in 2020. Transparency International uh, is a business that uh, tries to gauge levels of perceived public sector corruption across the world. And the, the index scores from zero, which is highly corrupt, to 100, which is, which is basically clean. The average score, by the way, is 43. Um, and two thirds of countries, including those shown, score less than 50. Um, and, the, and the research every year finds that corruption is pretty rampant across the world. Perhaps COVID-19 has made it worse. Which country came highest or best in the rankings for corruption? What do we think? Is it either Denmark, New Zealand, Sweden or Germany? What do you think? Well, the best scoring uh, countries for corruption, in fact, were two. Denmark and Sweden were both ranked jointly as the countries with the least corruption in the world. Finland came third. And this chart basically shows um, the countries with the lowest perceived highest corruption, Denmark, New Zealand, Finland is in there, Singapore, Sweden, Switzerland, and then obviously at the bottom, South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, Venezuela, etc. By the way, the United States only came in in 25th, which is quite interesting. Quite a lot of anti-corruption concerns in that country. Okay, so just to finish off with, why might high levels of corruption act as a barrier to development. So in our, a few slides ago, we asked the question, why might the lack of property rights 
act as a barrier to corruption. Let's think about corruption uh, as, a, as an example. Well, loads of points again. I'll, I'll, I'll pick out six for you. Um, it deters foreign investment uh, because it increases the cost of doing business. If you have to uh, give politicians backhanders, bribes, kickbacks in order to secure land contracts and, and, and what have you, it clearly increases the cost of doing business and high levels of corruption will put off most bona fide companies. Uh, it leads to allocative inefficiency because oftentimes scarce public resources, scarce tax revenues are diverted away from social infrastructure and social capital, housing, healthcare, irrigation schemes, education, towards extravagant wealth, vanity projects, particularly in corrupt nations. So huge, loads, I'm sure you can find great examples of where politicians have spent billions of dollars on vanity projects. Governments often are unduly influenced by lobbying. So the power of political lobbying, influential corporate lobby companies can, can cause government failure. And clearly corruption contributes to, it's a major cause of persistent income and wealth inequality and cuts progress in cutting poverty. Crucial, I think, point five I would emphasise. In a country with a lot of corruption, there is an endemic loss of trust and a breakdown of social capital. And when countries, when people don't trust each other, to enforce contracts, to pay debts, etc. That increases, for example, the costs you have to pay for insurance. It increases the risks of doing business. Fundamentally, though, of course, corruption leads to poorer human development outcomes because the government's not often not collecting anywhere near enough tax revenues. By the way, economic growth can reduce corruption. So corruption can reduce growth. Growth can reduce corruption. There was a study in Vietnam, I think, that showed that when the amount of formal employment in an industry doubled, you know, formal employment, uh, people legitimately paying taxes and things, bribery fell by nearly two percentage points. So formal employment, wage labour, is often a catalyst for cutting corruption. OK, everybody, if you've stuck with me through to the end, we've hopefully covered quite a bit here, two, almost two topics in one video, uh, property rights and corruption. I think they're really important barriers to development. And if, you, and if you're studying particular countries, uh, look to see if you can find some great application to put in your assignments. Huge thanks for joining me and uh, see you next time.